This is Bible Academy. I'm Pastor Teacher Curtis Omo, and we are continuing our intermediate Bible training. But before we do that, let's make sure that we've confessed our sins, that we're allowing the Holy Spirit to control us. Let's pray. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the opportunity to study your word. We ask that we'll have open hearts and minds to your truth today. In Jesus' name, amen. Before we get started, I wanted to just make one brief announcement. Uh, there is another YouTube channel dedicated to children called Bible Academy for Children. It is up and running, not fully developed yet, but good enough if you would like to just go to that channel and visit that one and see if you would rather go there uh, for the children basically ranging from the ages of 6 to 12. All right, let's get into our study. We have been studying the book of James. We finished last time with verse 11, and our next verse is verse 12. Now, let me remind you that in the background of this epistle, we learned that the recipients of this epistle were going through various trials. They were being displaced from their homes. Many had to flee Jerusalem as that area went under persecution. Some would have to start over, perhaps some got to move in with family, but I expect for the most part many had to move out, perhaps as groups, and start their own Christian communities. They had to deal with religious as well as state authorities, and basically, like I said, start their lives over again. Very challenging when you have to go to a new place and, and find a new place to live, a place for your job, somewhere where you can do your trade. Uh, we saw that this test of the faith when passed was a good thing. We saw that these tests that they had to face, um, sometimes daily, multiple and various tests, it built endurance and contributed to their maturity and we need to keep that in mind that many of the tests that we receive is a test of our faith are we going to trust God and then when we do we build our perseverance and that leads to our maturity now in verse 12 we will see that enduring those trials bring even more eternal blessing. Not only is there maturity, but there is eternal reward for enduring under trial. James 1.12 reads, Blessed is the man who endures trials, because when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which is promised to those who love him. The word blessed is the adjective describing the state of a person. It's from a word we should be familiar with, the karyos. M-A-K-A-R-I-O-S. It means favored, fortunate, happy. And we translate it blessed. We have a hard time understanding this word in our society because it's used so loosely. But basically it has the idea of a person receives something from God. Here we see the blessed person 
is the word for man, on air. But in this context, it can be used for any person, male or female, people in general. And the word for endure is the verb for the word that we had for endurance back in verse 3, where we are built up uh, by our test of faith to endurance. And then we have the word trials again. Let's look at our verse one more time. Blessed is the man who endures trials. So these words should be getting familiar with us. The word for trial Perosmos means to put to the test, to examine, testing to determine the true character or nature of someone. And that's something you need to keep in mind because that's basically what this is saying. Uh, the person who is being tested, all right, he's going to be blessed course, assuming he passed the test, because when he has been approved, so he's being tested to be approved. He's being tested to see what he's made of. What people say today, uh, the metal, what, uh, you know, the metal he's made of. The word is uh, dokimas, means accepted, tried, approved. He's tested for genuineness to see if he's approved by God. And the reason for this, he's blessed and all of this is because he will receive the crown of life. Now, this crown is Stephanos. S-T-E-F-A-N-O-S. It is the wreath or the garland given to the winner in the public games. By that we mean when they held their uh, annual uh, public games for entertainment for the people. We call ours Olympics. Um, some of this is where the origin of it came from Greece, of course, but uh, the idea carried over into Rome where there was competitive games. Uh, the Stephanos is a competitive crown. It's something that's won by competition. Uh, so the idea is, <clears throat> for us as Christians, that this Stephanos is something that can be won. Not necessarily that we're competing with anybody, but if you say that, it would probably be just with ourselves because Christians, many Christians, can win the Stephanos. So it's not that we're competing against other Christians. It's just that it's there and available for those who want to serve and win this crown and listen carefully, through merit. So, let's look at our verse one more time. <clears throat> Blessed is the man who endures trials because when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which is promised to those who love him. Two parts to receive in this crown of life. One is that he endures trials. He passes them. And connected to that is the fact that he loves the Lord. And we've learned that loving the Lord is manifested from those who obey him. Now, the crown of life is a reward given to believers 
who have, to put it metaphorically, entered the battle of spiritual warfare. Passing test after test of faith, enduring trial after trial, proving oneself worthy of not only this mark of distinction, but the attendant reward that comes with it. And then it's promised to those who love him. This designates that the crown is promised to those who love the Lord, demonstrated by our consistent obedience to him. Now the crown of life is one of three crowns mentioned in scripture that believers can receive. And for that purpose, we are now going to go to the doctrine of the crowns. Now I'm going to put the entire uh, doctrine up on the board for you so we can go through it together. This will all show up for you on the screen. <clears throat> Introduction. A. As believers, we will all receive a basic inheritance package with such things as our resurrection body, eternal life, a permanent blessed state, an eternal home. We might not give this much thought, but we, if we were to die today, we would go to heaven. We would also be in the millennium, and then when the time comes, we would be in the new heavens and earth. Acts 20.32 Ephesians 1.14 and 18, 5, 5, especially that one, the asterisk indicates that's one you should especially check out. Colossians 1, 12, especially that one. 3, 24, Hebrews 9, 15, 1 Peter 1, 4. Again, Acts 20, 32, Ephesians 1, 14, and 18, 5, 5. Colossians 1 12, 3 24, Hebrews 9 15, 1 Peter 1 4. That's our basic inheritance package. Every believer receives this. Let's look at Colossians 3 23 and 24. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. B, under introduction, rewards. In addition, there are rewards for our good works. Love, giving, prayer, hospitality, Helping others, loving your enemies, confidence, seekers of God. Hebrews 10.35 Now some are listed in Revelation 2 and 3 at the end of the evaluation of the seven churches. Now I will tell you this, I think those rewards are probably, and I haven't completely studied this out, are probably on the level of the crowns. Whereas the uh, other awards, and I would say these, between, these are between the basic inheritance package and the upper rewards, are these rewards that we're talking about right now. For giving, for love, for prayer, for hospitality. Verse C. Matthew 16, 27. Jesus spoke of rewards several times. 
uh, Matthew 16, 27. For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what he has done. So we see here there's a level of rewards above the basic inheritance package. And these come for such things as I mentioned above. And we have some scriptures for those. Matthew 5, 12. Matthew 5, 46, 6, 1, and 4. These rewards that our Lord mentions while he was on earth. Paul mentions rewards also. 1 Corinthians 3, 14 and 9, 17. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 3, 8. The man who plants and the man who waters have one purpose. And each will be rewarded according to his own labor. So at this point, we understand that every believer receives a basic inheritance package, and then those who serve and obey obediently start to receive rewards. Now let me make this comment. I'm not sure why, but I expect it's because believers have feared the idea of works. Because we know that we don't work for salvation. And for some reason we have thought that we don't work for reward. Or there's something there that we're not supposed to be involved with through works. But Christian works good works, those in the power of the Spirit and the will of God, are a major part of a Christian's life and his activity, his service. We are all, as Christians, expected to be doing something for the Lord. Uh, not only in our ministry, but in our daily lives. Go through some of those scriptures regarding reward that our Lord spoke about. How we are to treat others. To love our enemies. Prayer. These are all rewardable activities. And we should seriously be doing them. Major point two, Roman numeral two, is the crowns, where we come to our subject. Roman numeral two, crowns. The scripture mentions three major rewards given in the form of a crown. A, the crown of life. The scripture is our verse, James 1.12. Blessed is the man who endures trials, because when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which is promised to those who love him. We see it again in Revelation 2.10. Do not be afraid of what you're about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for ten days. Be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. The Greek word we've already looked at, but let's look at it briefly again. Stephanos. It is the wreath or garland given to the winner in the public games. This is a competitive crown, something that can be won. Number three is a comment. The crown of life is awarded to those believers who have remained faithful while enduring trial after trial while growing to maturity. B is the crown of righteousness. 2 Timothy 4 8. Scripture. 1 the Scripture. 
Finally, the crown of righteousness is reserved for me, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved, who have loved, now notice I put the word loved, for his appearing. Not very good English. The idea is, that the actual Greek word there is loved. I'll talk about that in a moment. Some have translated it longed, but the literal translation, who have loved for his appearing. Now I should straighten that out, but let's look at why I did what I did in a moment. Again, the Greek word for crown is stephanos. And here's the comment. This context is that of judgment and reward by our Lord Jesus Christ, the righteous judge. It is given to those who have stuck it out, fought the good fight, kept the faith, finished the race, who have maintained the righteous life. One of the mental attitudes that those receiving this reward is that they love. The word that we saw back up here is agape, a perfect participle. The action is completed. So they are they have spent their thinking and their attitude looking forward to his appearing. So one way to put it is have loved his appearing. But see, it hasn't come yet. So that's the, that's the Greek uh, idea of this. Indicating this has went on for a long period of time. And so you have the translation and some of your translations long for his appearing, but the actually actual word is agape for love. C the crown of glory. One the scripture. First Peter five four. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. Another scripture, Philippians 4, 1. Therefore, my brothers, you whom I have love and long for, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, this is how you should stand firm in the Lord, dear friends. Now what we're seeing here is, is that the people are a manifestation of, of his reward of the crown of glory. The people are called his joy and crown. Similar thing in verse 19 of 1 Thessalonians 2.19. For what is our hope, our joy, or the crown in which we will glory, and the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes? Is it not you? You see, notice the glory, the word glory. For what is our hope, our joy, or the crown in which we will glory? You see, it's these people. They are contributing by their response to the word, to the crown of glory for the Apostle Paul and his team. The Greek word to get is Stephanos. Point three is the comment. In 1 Peter 5, Peter writes about sharing with the elders the glory to be revealed. Now that's referring back up here in verse 4. So I'm commenting on that. He writes on the attitude and example that the elders should have in their service. 
So that is indicator. That's an indicator that this is to those who are serving other people. Now in our second two passages, Philippians 4.1 and 1 Thessalonians 2.9, here's the comment for that. We see that it is related to the people served. So that this crown is related to one's service for Christ, how he uses his God-given spiritual gifts. And we can say in this context it has to do with how he uses it towards the people. So the crown of glory has to do with your service gift. Roman numeral three is how to win crowns. Second Timothy two three through five. Endure hardship with us like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. He wants to please his commanding officer. Similarly, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not receive the victor's crown unless he competes according to the rules. So Paul compares winning the crown with what a soldier does and an athlete does. We'll comment on this in a moment. But before we do, let's look at one other passage. 1 Corinthians 9.24 Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last. But we do it to get a crown that will last forever. And notice that phrase. We do it. What do you do? You go into training to get a crown that will last forever. Verse 26. Therefore, I do not run like a, like a man running aimlessly. I do not fight like a man beating the air. No, I beat my body, I discipline my body, and I make it a slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. B. Comment. In order to win crowns, the believer must be willing to endure hardship and suffering. Like a soldier who is devoted to his duty, so the believer is singularly dedicated to his service for Christ. Let me put that in other words. This is what you live for. This is what you do. Everything else is supportive of that. The second comparison is of an athlete. Let's continue on in the comment. Like an athlete who must follow the rules for training, qualification, and the games, so the believer must be willing to be trained, qualified, and gifted in the area in which he serves. Now folks, these comments under this comment section is something that we need to have down pat. This gives us direction and purpose in life. We get so distracted by the world, the world telling us what we need to do, what we need to accomplish, what we need to have, what we need to be. That's not the Christian life. That's not what we're here to do. We understand we're only here temporarily to fulfill a service to our Lord and then we pass on to be with our Lord.
This is a paragraph I would read over and over until we understand clearly. And it sunk into our minds while we are here. Four. The loss of crowns. Roman numeral four, loss of crowns. A scripture. Revelation 3.11 I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. 1 Corinthians 9.27 No, I beat my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. 2 John 8 Watch out that you do not lose what you have worked for, but that you may be rewarded fully. Now, a comment. It is a clear possibility that believers can lose crowns that they have qualified at one time for and then be disqualified. Now let me say this, when you as a Christian decide to get into the battle, you will start a path that is designed to be difficult, designed to be hard. And you'll find that in every area of your life, your job, your family, if you have a family, in your social life, in your struggle sometimes just to survive, in your studies, you will find yourself being challenged from all directions. But you see, that's part of the training. It's who you are becoming at that time, not necessarily what you are doing. And when you're ready for service, God will place you at His time, in His place, and perhaps with those whom you are to serve. But one can decide to say, I'm not going to do this. Or I've had enough. Or I'm going to jump out of ministry. Because I can't stand this constant conflict with people. And believe me, I know what that's like. I've had it for many, many years. You're trying to teach the truth, and they really don't want it. So they're out to get you to stop teaching and conform to what they want as a pastor while you have a handful of people who really want the teaching. And unfortunately, in the design of so many uh, churches' government, uh, you get voted out because the majority don't want it. And that's sad. But that also is a challenge for those believers who are hungry for the word. Are they going to continue seeking? Which is a reward, by the way. So let's understand that rewards, these crowns, can be lost. As well as reward. The time of rewarding of the crowns is Roman numeral 5. Time of rewarding of the crowns. The scripture. 2 Timothy 4.8 Finally, the crown of righteousness is reserved for me, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but all to who have loved for his appearing That is a unique translation, isn't it? Revelation eleven eighteen. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come. The time has come for judging the dead and for, for rewarding your servants, the prophets, and your saints, and those who reverence your name, both small and great and for destroying those who destroy the earth. That's going to be quite a time 
when our Lord returns at the end of the Armageddon campaign and basically wipes out the enemy armies and begins to set up the millennium and begins the reward, the award ceremony. Revelation 22:12. <clears throat> Behold, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to everyone according to what he has done. B of the comment. Of the second advent of Christ, Christ's award crowns to all believers who have attained the standard of merit for that particular crown. And there are some believers who win, will win all three crowns. Um, we call it in baseball the triple crown. What a fantastic thing that would be for many of you listening to these studies to win the triple crown and it's there and it's available and there is time if you're alive if you have not squandered your life God can use you in fantastic ways but let me tell you for many it takes a major rearrangement of one's life and his priorities you may have to work into that over time uh, there's a lot of things we have to eliminate. There's a number of things we have to do, perhaps with our personal lives, with our own habits. Uh, we have to deal with family every day. Uh, certainly that is a priority in our life and always to remain a priority. But God provides for that also. So, all of you can win all three crowns and have a higher place of glory and eternity. And let me say this, I don't want to end on a negative note on this doctrine, but those crowns can be squandered and one can come up to our Lord and realize the shame and the wastefulness that he had in his life instead of pursuing the glorification of Christ and who he is and what he does. And I would encourage all of you, if you haven't already, to set aside time daily to seriously study the Word of God and trusting God that He will guide you, He will encourage you, and He will strengthen you to get where you can start this path to reward. There's a lot today said about heroes, particularly military men. Um, I was in, my, in the service myself, and actually, I, I, frankly, I get kind of bothered when people say, thank you for serving. I just started up about, you know, 10 years ago. People find out I was in the service. But that was my regular duty, as far as I'm concerned. That was what I owed my country. Uh, to go above and beyond is another thing. These crowns are going above and beyond what many Christians will ever do. Though they can all do it. They can all serve wholeheartedly and they can all receive major crowns. <clears throat> Well, that ends the Doctrine of the Crowns. Let's continue on with verse 13 in James. Now, beginning in verse 13, because of the wording, this verse, in fact, this section leaves some people confused. And I'll explain why. Let me first read the verse. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, 
and he himself tempts no one. So let me first address why it's confusing, and then we'll get to the verse. The f confusion comes mostly from the use of the same or similar words for trials and tests that we see in the various English translations. Back in verse 2, we started that section of study on trials or tests for the believer. It was in regard to his faith. We saw that the person who went through the trial or testing, depending on your translation, I use the word trial. Let's look at those verses. Let's look at the first one and the last one where the words are mentioned. Verse 2. Consider it all joy, my brothers, when you encounter various trials. Periosmos, that's the word. And then verse 12. Blessed is the man who endures trials, periosmos, because when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which is promised to those who love him. Now that's the verse we just finished. Now this is trials or test of the faith. And certainly God allows that in our lives, perhaps bring those in our lives. Now we're going to look at another type of test. But this is not a test from God. And that's where the confusion comes in because they use the same words. <clears throat> Now what we just saw in verses 2 and 12 was the noun. The verb form of this same word is used three times in verse 13. So let me just kind of try to simplify this a little bit. In 112, well, I would say 1, 2, and verse 12. We, I'm going to do it in the English periosmos. That's the noun. And we translate that test or trial. But that had to do with a test or trial of our faith. And remember, that led to endurance. Now we're going to take the verb form. The verb form... I'm going to use the English again as parazo. Okay, parazo. But now this has to do with more, and I'm going to translate it this way so we'll have the distinction tempted. Tempted in the area of sin. And that's confusing because we go right from verse 12 and talk about being tested to verse 13, and now we're being tempted, you see. But we've completely changed another category. All right? So let's look at verse 13. I want to break it down and show you the word and the Greek to clarify what I'm saying. Let no one say when he is tempted. Present middle participle, parazzo. I am tempted, present middle indicative of parazzo, by God. For God is untemptable. Here we see, see the alpha negative in front of parastos, untemptable, of evil. And he himself tempts, present acting indicative of parazzo, no one. Now, let's look at the verb parazzo. We would expect a similar meaning, and there is, to the noun, except, of course, this is a verb. It means to try, to make a trial of. And in this context, it is it is to try to make 
someone sin. That's why I translated it tempt to keep it distinguished from the other word for test. Now, let me show you another way to distinguish between these two terms from our two contexts. In verse 2, do you remember what the testing of our faith was to produce? What did the testing of our faith produce? Endurance. So that's what we want out of that testing. All right? However, tempting what do we want, what do we want to do with tempting we want to resist all right hopefully we've got that sorted out as we come to this new subject which is about tempting Beginning in verse 13, James changes the subject from testing of our faith to temptation to sin. Now, both of these are major areas where a believer is challenged. Okay? These are two major areas where believers struggle. And where we need to be determined to break through on both of them. Well, let's look at verse 13 one more time. As we will get into the detail of the verse now. Let no one say when he is tempted to sin, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil and he himself tempts no one. And then I added to clarify to sin. God does not test the believer by tempting him to sin. Now let's make that clear. God does not test the believer by tempting him to sin. Then James begins to explain why one should never say that. For God cannot be tempted by evil, or that could mean evil people. Literally, I saw we saw this in the breakdown earlier, for God is untemptable of evil things or people. And that's a translation that many of your, tra your translations will have, for God cannot be tempted. It basically says God is untemptable. He cannot be tempted. The word for untemptable, I'm going to use, I'm going to put two words together up here on the screen because it is untemptable of evil. All right? So we're going to look at both words at the same time. Aperostas for untemptable or untempted. And it's with the word kakos, evil, in the genitive case. God is untemptable of evil. Now, grammarians call this a genitive of means, that is, kakos is in a genitive of means. A genitive case is usually uh, indicates possession or source. Uh, here it has means. And we use the word by. Okay? So God is cannot be tempted by evil, is what many of the translations will say. Now, let me remind you of something we did at the introduction of this series. Do you remember... Um, I mentioned there are three basic themes that repeat themselves in the book of James. 
We're speaking about two of those themes here. Two of those themes, uh, one was uh, issues that stem from sin. We've been dealing with, we're dealing with that right now. And the other issue, another issue that we see repeating in James is characteristics of God. And here we see that here. God is untemptable of evil. Well, let's take up the teaching, the point of why God cannot be tempted. We'll look at that under a few points. Why God cannot be tempted. Number one, God is holy. Holiness means that he is set apart. Now, we don't often understand this term holy in our daily life. We don't use it except using some sort of uh, expletive. Um, or we refer to our Bible as holy. And yet we know the Bible teaches us to be holy. But holiness, the idea in the Old Testament, in Scripture, is that it is something that is set apart from all that is common. So, to put it this way, this is everything that's going on in the world, all that's common. Human beings, what they do, nature, life in general. To be holy means you're set apart from it. God is holy. This includes the idea, idea that he's set apart from the sin and evil. God is sinless. Without any taint of sin or evil. Now if you're familiar at all with the Old Testament, holy is a frequent term often used in describing God. One of the major passages is in Leviticus 44. 11.44 Leviticus 11.44 I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourselves and be holy because I am holy. Do not make yourselves unclean by any creature that moves about on the ground. Verse 45, I am the Lord who brought you up out of Egypt to be your God. Therefore be holy because I am holy. Also Psalm 99.3 5 and 9. All three verses are in Psalm 99, verses 3, 5, and 9. God is called the Holy One of Israel, Psalm 71, 22. His way is holy, Psalm 77, 13. His name is holy, Psalm 97 12 103 1 105 3 and there are many many other verses regarding his name as holy and the name of course represented his character his dwelling is holy psalm 68 5 now point two and again, this is answering the question, why God cannot be tempted. Point one, God is holy. Point two, God is righteous. God is righteous. God is perfectly right and just. Everything God does is perfectly right and just. So it's not only part of his character, but always part of his actions. God cannot be otherwise. He cannot 
act otherwise. God is righteous, Nehemiah 9 6, Job 4 17, Psalm 4 1, and 7 9. Nehemiah 9 6, Job 4 17, Psalm 4 1, and 7 9. Psalm 11.7 says, For the Lord is righteous, he loves justice, upright men will see his face. His decisions, laws, judgments are righteous. Psalm 19.9 9. He will judge the world in righteousness. Acts 1731. So when we come back to our verse now, and it says, For God cannot be tempted by evil. The reason is, is that God is holy. Evil cannot even begin to tempt him. He's completely separated from it. Always is and always will be. And we also connect to the fact, connect to the fact that God is holy and righteous is the characteristic of immutability, meaning that God cannot change. So God cannot change in his holiness or in his righteousness. It's an infinite characteristic of his being. So there's another characteristic of God. Infinity. God cannot change in his holiness. It is an infinite characteristic of his being. His immovable in it. So. God is holy. Righteous. And in these, he is infinite and immutable. Now, one might ask the question, and it's a good question, but did not Satan in his fallen state talk to God in the book of Job? And Satan was evil, yes, he did talk to God in the book of Job. And did not Satan tempt Jesus at the end of his time in the wilderness? Yes, Satan did talk to Jesus. Now let me explain both of these. Let's look at the scene between God and Satan in Job 1.6. Now, Put on your thinking cap. The whole scene and exchange between God and Satan in Job 1, 6 and following does not tell us, does not indicate that God cannot communicate with evil beings. Now let me illustrate that. You can talk to someone who is evil. But that doesn't mean that you are being influenced by them or even being tainted by them in any way. Or that you're really associated with them. I work in a store and people come by and I say hello. I know nothing about them. That doesn't reflect upon my character in fact, if anything, I reflect upon theirs by giving them a greeting. They may say, hello back, how are you? But there's no exchange of, of uh, character or influence there. You're not compromising your character in any way. After all, God relates to us in many ways and we still sin. And we 
fall into Satan's trap and sometimes are influenced by evil. And that is why we must confess our sin before we go before God in our prayer or have it at the beginning of our prayer. That is why we must confess our sins and get ourselves cleaned up before we expect any kind of serious fellowship with God. Sin has to be dealt with. And that's why we're required by Scripture to make sure that we confess our sins. We have to go to the cross and the work of Christ every time we sin. And God will relate to us. Now let's talk about the incident with Jesus and the devil. Now we need to keep in mind with Jesus, it's a unique situation, of course. He is the God-man. He is the God-man. Fully God, full divinity, at the same time, fully human. The Godward part, untemptable. The manward part, temptable. However, there's a major caveat with that. Now, in his exchange with Satan, we see how his humanity chose not to give in to Satan. though genuinely tempted in his humanity. But in his divinity, put divinity on that side and humanity on this side, he was totally untemptable. Holiness and righteousness remain perfectly intact and immovable. All right? And the major caveat here is, is because these two were connected. That the humanity of Christ had tremendous strength to resist. He was also controlled with the Spirit. Christ was never not controlled by the Spirit. And he was without sin as well as without, I should say, without a sin nature. Now we'll just leave it at that. The next phrase of verse 13 And he himself tempts no one to sin. God in no way possible will tempt anyone to disobey his clearly stated moral will or to sin. Now God will allow us to be tempted by sin, but that's not a direct act of God. And this is where the existence of free will is indisputable. We could not genuinely be tempted unless we had free will. And since we just studied the crowns, we could not rightly earn rewards or crowns if not for free will. From Adam and Eve to you and me, we make choices from our volition, whether we are going to sin or to serve. From sin to service, we make choices. Verse 13, our complete translation. Let no one say when he is tempted to sin, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself tempts no one to sin. 
Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this very challenging lesson, one that goes deep, one that challenges us to think through these major issues in our life. And as we go over these things, we ask that we might understand, believe, and that in your power we will apply them inwardly to our lives and then act them out, live them out and are following you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.